Hello guys, hope I'm audible and visible. If so, say me a hi, hello. Raj Kingdom, don't worry. You will understand, listen carefully, read the subject and come, definitely you'll understand. Okay, shall we, shall we start? Hello, yeah. So we are in the second uh, class of RA today. So here, like you can see, we are going to cover uh, inflammation and infections, right? So I'll keep it short and sweet for you. So this is a revision session. So everyone who's watching or attending the Ferry series, please go through the PDF, uh, which is available free of cost for everyone in the PW Medit app and definitely follow up the class. It will be a double revision for you for your upcoming exams. Fine. Okay. So let's go without any delay to our topic of inflammation and infections. So what we are going to talk today is about an acute inf uh, infection, acute inflammation, chronic inflammation. We'll talk about wound healing. We'll talk about tuberculosis and a little bit about acute phase diatons if time permits, right? So this will be the overview of what we're going to do. I'm going to do the same thing, what we did for your first chapter, cell injury and adaptation. So we have just given an uh, overview of what all questions probably can come in your cell injury and adaptation. The same thing we're going to do for acute chronic inflammation as well as your infection chapter. And uh, after that, we'll definitely go on to the topics per se, fine. So if we'll take again, I'm going to say a long answer question and a short answer question, right? So if you take a long answer question, hello, good morning, Shan, good evening, Shanks. If you take a long answer question, in case of inflammation per se, the chance of getting a long answer question is a bit tricky because unless and until you talk about the entire acute inflammation process, then it's okay, probably a good one for a long answer or entire wound healing process along with your uh, factors affecting wound healing and diseases with wound healing, fine. Good evening, Anuradha. Uh, Ma'am, since you called me beta, uh, good evening, Arjun. Right? And uh, th that's the only way I can see that the entire acute inflammation, if they ask, there is a probability it can come as a long answer question. Again, uh, most of your long answer questions are system. So you might have uh, something of uh, a mosquito bite or a uh, bacterial infection, and then they might ask you to el elaborate what happens in acute inflammation. Fine. Good evening, PK. Then, like I said, there's a possibility that wound healing can come as a long answer question. And most importantly, since we are in acute inflammation infection chapter, there's a very high possibility tuberculosis can come as a long answer question, right? So if I am, um, if I am the examiner, I would personally prefer TB to be in the answer because TB is something which I feel that every uh, person in our country as a doctor should know entire thing about tuberculosis, be it your... Uh, primary tuberculosis, secondary tuberculosis, pathogenesis, the way to diagnose, everything is required. So we'll have a brief discussion on how to approach a case of tuberculosis, what all might be the history you can encounter in case of a long answer question with respect to tuberculosis, right? So when you come to short answer questions, there are a good amount of short answer questions here, fine? Good evening, Anuradha. Good evening, Gaming Molo. Okay, so short answer questions, the first thing which I want you to remember is mediators of inflammation. Though mediators can come as a long answer, I would prefer it to be a short answer because mediators doesn't have any concepts. It's just memorizing. Please remember the prostaglandin leukotriene, the tree. That's important. There are multiple questions which can come in that aspect, right? And you will have a very good possibility of an acute phase reactance coming as a short answer question. Because acute phase reactance is something, uh, your positive and the negative acute phase reactance. We have read about it. The reason why acute phase reactance is probably a very good bet is if you have lived through the COVID, right, if you've been in your 12th standard or someone must have been suffering from your COVID in your family or your relatives, right? So during COVID, what, how we monitored COVID is with the help of this acute phase reactance, the serum ferritin, the D-dimer, the CRP, everything, right? Okay. So that's why acute phase reactance is important. I'm just starting Anuradha. So just stay with me. We'll definitely understand it. Fine. It's just an overview of the topic. Fine. Uh, thank you, Mark Thandavarma. Fine. I hope you will uh, be inspiration for your juniors as well, right? So since acute phase reactance has lots of application in real life medicine, as a doctor, you'll be writing ESR, you'll be writing CRP investigation. So that's a possibility. It can come as a short answer, right? Then, transudase versus exudate. There's a high possibility that this can come at least as a two-mark question or in a viva because transudate is something which I want you to know. Exudate runs till you practice medicine every infection what comes out of it pus pus to the next day so definitely there is a possibility here fine okay and then any other short answer question which can come here is granulomas the formation of a granuloma 
the different types of a granuloma is a very very good source for a short answer question as well you can be asked about the entire process of phagocytosis because phagocytosis again which is something which is important for an undergraduate because that's the starting point so once you understand phagocytosis i am sure you will understand many more things in future right so this is an overview of what can come in an acute inflammation or an inflammation chapter an infection chapter there are few things which are there in robins in infection like your malaria like your filaria i am sure the best place to write those question from is from microbiology i am 100% sure dr mamta must have covered it elaborately take it from that i wouldn't recommend you to read the infection chapter from robins maybe for tuberculosis we'll learn them the rest of the infections there are lots like there are viruses chickenpox is there in robins i wouldn't recommend you to read from robins go with microbiology textbooks because they have a very strong base of every infection disorder right okay with that note let's go on to our today's topic of inflammation like i said from first parre is an revision series so i want you guys to quickly see through everything and then come for the class so that it's a quick revision so you can easily finish pathology well before your mock exams fine so when i say inflammation the first thing which might happen in aviva i want everyone who's online here to comment on it what are the cardinal signs of any inflammation we'll start with the simple things which you already know because most of the viva questions start with the cardinal signs because that's like an ice breaking between a teacher and a student most of you will definitely say about cardinal signs as well right so you know about rubber calla right i'm sure you know them the cardinal signs of any inflammation for me is rubber for the redness calla for the temperature tumor for the swelling dolor the name dolo 650 the tablet paracetamol came from dolor dolor means pain right that's pain and then we have functional asia or loss of function any organ you have an inflammation in the thumb that might be a possibility i cannot use the thumb the loss of function that's all you have an arthritis you cannot walk properly it's also a loss of function it can be an internal organ or it can be in physical organ anything i have i have a loss of function right and all these signs were given by a person called a celsus so they call them an celsus sign of inflammation if there is a question two mark question on celsus sign of inflammation you should not panic it's the same cardinal sign the first four this was given by the father of modern pathology your rudolf virchow you must have read about virchow stride and everything right so rudolf virchow gave about this and rest everything was given by celsus these are the major cardinal signs of inflammation right now let's go to the initial thing of acute inflammation right so since you guys are here online so tell me what is the cell of acute inflammation uh, let's make it more interactive so that you don't uh, have a problem whenever you uh, have a viva here right consider me as a teacher or an examiner what is the cell of acute inflammation cell of acute inflammation is very simple right so acute inflammation has few characteristics the first one they are short lived they may be for hours weeks maximum weeks couple of days right it cannot go beyond a week maximum can go within a week right perfect away neutrophil is a cell of acute inflammation right so first thing when i have anything in your exam any question which comes in the exam should have a very good start see because if the start is good mostly they don't even look into the details of it so when i say an acute inflammation starting point is it has three major components the characteristics and obviously the leukocytes and obviously the signs of inflammation right it's an short lived inflammation okay which stands for hours to days it generally doesn't go beyond a few days that's the maximum limit right and it is characterized by infiltration of neutrophils right so when you have infiltration of neutrophils that's the primary thing regarding acute inflammation will there be an uh, will acute inflammation end in a scar formation yes or no arjun nothing and abhay nothing please change your name next time i want your name to be seen fine okay you're not nothing you're everything will there be a scar formation in acute inflammation generally no right so in by characterized by infiltration of neutrophils and ends with regeneration or wound healing okay 
So it's it'll heal. Generally, you won't have a scar formation in case of an acute inflammation. Like a simple example, a mosquito bite is an acute inflammation. Do you think you'll have a scar formation? You won't have a scar formation. It'll regenerate automatically and come back to normal. This is a crisp definition of acute inflammation. For any exam purpose, whatever question it is, start with the definition if it's a theoretical question. If it's a practical question, let's say there's a history of a, um, a infection with an exudate is given and asked is acute or chronic, like a stem clinical question and a stem. Start with data points for diagnosis. It's for short lived. So I think of an acute. There's an exudate pus. So I think of an acute. Then say with all the probabilities, my diagnosis is an acute inflammation, then start writing. Because a structure of a question is very, very important from an university exam point of view. For a real life or for an MCQ exam, that's not required. But for a university exam, the structure is very, very important. Fine. Now let's go to the steps of acute inflammation. I am sure you guys know the step of acute inflammation. And maybe you can write this as well. The hallmark of acute inflammation is very, very simple and straightforward. It is vasodilatation. and increase in vascular permeability okay so vasodilatation and increase in vascular permeability is a very classical hallmark of any acute inflammation in our body right so what are the steps involved in acute inflammation you have three or four major steps the first step is where the neutrophil moves along the blood vessel what is it called as you call them rolling right the second step is where it stops or it adheres. After that, it moves outside or we call it diapedesis. Then goes to the site of infection called as a chemotaxis, ends up with phagocytosis and killing of the organism, right? That is the basic goal. So again, when you have a long answer on acute inflammation, I want you to give an outline. So the first slide, whatever is there, put first thing, whatever is there put forward to an examiner, it should convey that, okay, I know most of the things overall, right? Let's give you an example. Let's assume, draw like this, a blood vessel with a neutrophil inside. Just a random blood vessel neutrophil inside and maybe right here, a store, source of streptococcus. They have streptococcus here and I have a blood vessel here. The goal is very simple. The first thing, put an arrow mark and write, it goes towards a corner. And right here, the first step for me is margination. So once margination happens, elaborate on it. Elaborate on it so that a single image should be able to convey to the examiner, okay, you know quite a good amount of stuff, right? So again, draw an endothelium, draw a proper neutrophil and put dots like this. So this is my second step. What am I describing here? What step is this? Can anyone comment on this? A neutrophil moving along the endothelium this is called as the second step it's your rolling perfect so once i have rolling done then it stops at one point right let's assume it stops here it stops here so you put a static neutrophil here that's my third step it's called as an adhesion so once the neutrophil rolls it adheres the next step is put a gap here the every image here should be descriptive. It is not descriptive because this is something which is a motion picture. I cannot depict rolling in an image or diapodis is an image, right? So put a gap here and just like this, draw, it's going outside. Once it goes outside, you know it is the next step, the fourth step, the diapodesis. Diapodesis is transmigration of a WBC across the endothelium, right? Now I have the organism here which may step to okay. So after it underwent diapodesis, again put an arrow mark, slowly it goes to the organism and this arrow mark is your movement. So call it here, chemotaxis. So chemotaxis, then it ends with phagocytosis and killing. See for a convenience of space, I have drawn it horizontally. If you want to draw it vertically in your exam paper, so it will fill an entire page, right? So you can write margination, select your uh, rolling, your addition, your diapodesis, uh, chemotaxis and phagocytosis. If you write it vertically, you'll have enough space to write what is responsible for margination, what is responsible for rolling, what is responsible for addition as well, right? I'll also write in the form of a table, but if you can structure it in a straight line, 
everything finishes in a single page that's more than enough for, for any exam right so let's look at few video so that you can understand the concept what happens behind rolling an addition this is a beautiful extracellular matrix okay sorry you can see the endothelium here and you can see the e selectin and p selectin which are projecting from the endothelium right so you have a neutrophil here the neutrophil has something called as an cll lewis x selx stands for cll lewis x right so that binds here it's a very weak bond that's why the blood the blood flow you can see the rbc going in the background it pushes them to the next to the to the next so it rolls across the entire endothelium so for rolling i need two things for sure one is cll lewis x the other one is selectin we'll briefly elaborate everything soon fine right? so once this happens obviously i have to go to the next step so the next step here what happens here is this is the same neutrophil here you can see lfa lfa is a subtype of integrin okay so lfa binds to something called a scam the green ones are called a scam right that's adhesion it stops there once it stops there the next element for me is to go outside right so it automatically goes outside with the process called as diapedesis so once diabetes happens, you can see the green color dots. Those are the molecules, chemotactic factors. It moves to the site of infection. And then it engulfs phagocytosis and it completely kills the organism, right? I hope this visual will help you to sequentially know whatever happens, right? So it's margination, rolling, addition, diapedesis, chemotaxis, followed by phagocytosis. See, these six terms are more than enough for you to fetch a mark which will be decent enough in a long answer if it's a short answer just write it horizontally and finish it within one or one and a half phase right now let's slightly elaborate one or two salient points required for this right the so first margination see when you're writing in an exam first you have to define what do i mean by margination and the factors or molecules which helps in margination margination is where the neutrophils, I am straightly writing neutrophils and not writing WBCs, will align along the endothelium. Okay. Will align along the endothelium. And the most important thing is from a laminar flow. Because initially, what we have is a laminar flow. What do you mean by laminar flow? In a laminar flow, I want to get a comment. Where do you think you will have cells in a laminar flow? Center or periphery? In a normal laminar flow, you will have cells in the center, right? So, from a laminar flow, the neutrophils align across the endothelium. That's what is margination. Every cell here comes to the corner. That's my endothelium, right? So, things which help in margination is a vasodilatation. Okay, you can just write it's the reason for margination is vasodilatation, and you can add on saying that it's the turbulence caused due to vasodilatation it's just getting dilated and it's becoming turbulent right so once it becomes turbulent and gets dilated there's one more molecule which is important for margination which is selectin so this is just a two line but it conveys to the examiner you know what is margination you also know what helps or what is responsible for the margination it's a vasodilatation i have a turbulent it goes to the corner selectin holds them selectin helps right that's margination What's the second step after margination in case of an acute inflammation? You guys know, we just now saw, right? It was the rolling, right? So next step is rolling. So rolling, you need not define what is rolling because it's self-defined, right? It's rolls, the WBC rolls along the endothelial wall till it finds the place to adhere or the place to escape. That's what, if you want to write rolling, you can write, okay? Rolling is due to a weak binding or a weak bond between neutrophils and your endothelium. Okay. It's a very weak bond between neutrophils and your endothelium. That's what I mean by rolling. Right? So what are the factors involved in rolling? You know there are two main factors, which is perfect, which is your, in your endothelium, again define this. See, you know for a fact that endothelium, like you saw in the video, had selectin. But if you write just selectin and CLL Lewis X, you might not conveying what is required for, from an examiner's point of view. I want that in endothelium, you have E selectin and you have P selectin. If you want to score extra mark, do write that P selectin will be present in a place called as a 
weeble palate bodies. Okay? So you'll have them in weeble palate bodies, the P selectin, and this binds. This binds with the protein which is present on the WBC, which is Thialyl Lewis X receptor. Okay. So you have Thialyl Lewis X receptor on your WBC and you have selectin molecules, E selectin and P selectin on the endothelium. With the help of this binding, it automatically rolls. So my rolling is sorted. Okay. The next step is addition. Again, addition is defined by a phenomenon where the rolling WBC will stop at a particular point of in the endothelium defined by chemokines. Everything here is defined by chemokines only, right? So second part when you take, it's addition. The addition is self-explanatory. Again, you can write it's a very strong bond between your endothelium and obviously your WBC. And for this bond to happen, you can do the same thing. In endothelium, I have something. And in your WBC, I have something. And the bond is strong, right? It's a very strong bond. So endothelium, I have something present. Yeah. You have ICAM and VCAM. CAM stands for cell addition molecule. If you want to expand it, you can expand it. But at the uh, uh, when you it's an university exam, you also know what CAM is. Generally, the teacher also knows what CAM is, right? So if you want to use short form, it's okay. But I would say better write in an elaborate form so that you don't have any confusion with the examiner. Fine. And WBC I have something called integrins. So we have integrins in the WBC and I have cell addition molecules in the endothelium. So this binding stops them. The third step is diapodesis. So we had rolling, we had addition, and then we had diapodesis. Diapodesis is a very, very important step because diapodesis generally, when you superficially read diapodesis, you will read only one uh, thing in diapodesis. Actually, diapodesis is composed of two important steps. Diapodesis has a definition. It's the process of leukocyte recruitment where the WBC migrates through an intact endothelium transmigration or diapodesis, right? Diapodesis means it's migration of WBC or neutrophils you can write through an endothelium. Okay. So how it migrates, like I said, superficially theory there are only one step in diapodesis, which you know that it's PCAM molecule based, CD31 based everything, right? If you learn carefully and you understand, there are two important steps in diapodesis. So what is the layer on which endothelium rests? Can anyone comment? What is the layer do you think on which endothelium sits? Endothelium doesn't float. Endothelium sits on a layer. What layer is that? It's called as, it's made of collagen. It's called as basement membrane, right? So any cell, any epithelium in my body lies on basement membrane. So endothelium in a blood vessel also lies on basement membrane. If the basement membrane is not destroyed, WBC cannot go outside. So like I said, there are two main components. One is action of collagenases. This is important. Most of the students miss them. I look for this to say, okay, I know that this student is a very good student, right? Action of collagenases via the neutrophil granules. With the help of neutrophil granules, because neutrophils have granules, you know them, they are granulocytes, right? So these neutrophil granules have collagenases. Okay, that's one. So once collagenase comes, they destroy, they don't rupture, they damage the endothelium, they put pores. It's a very non-specific or a weak collagenase. So when it put pores, it's easy for the WBC to squeeze out of the pore, right? And the next one which helps for the diapodesis is PECAM1. Again, Platelet endothelial cell addition molecule. If you want to write in brackets, its other name is C31, right? So with the help of these two, it comes outside. So once it comes outside, with the help of chemotactic factors, it reaches the site. That's very simple, right? The next thing, like I said, uh, phagocytosis per se can be in short answer, right? So you have to understand what is phagocytosis and you have to remember what is phagocytosis, right? So phagocytosis is a very simple process. If I have to define phagocytosis, nothing but eating. That's all. But there are multiple different steps in phagocytosis. Can anyone tell me any one step in phagocytosis? I cannot, my cell, WBC or macrophage, just cannot go and eat any cell. Before eating any cell, I should have few things. What is that? What is required before 
eating or before phagocytosing any cell in my body. If you're wrong, it's completely fine. You learn from here, that's all, so that you don't make the mistake in your main exam. If you want to eat, will you eat anything or will you eat only things which are tasty? Obviously, you will eat only things which are tasty, right? No one is going to eat anything, right? Only when the things are tasty, we're going to eat it. The same thing holds true for my WBC also. My WBC also is going to eat only things which are tasty. What is the step by which I will coat the bacteria with some material so that I can make it tasty? What is the step called as? You must have read that in your microbiology as well. You'll read, you must have read that in the pharmacology, your pathology also. It's called as? Start with O, we call it opsonization, right? It's opsonization, just eating, just engulfing and eating them, called as an opsonization, right? So, phagocytosis is a three step process, okay? So, when you, when you have any short answer on phagocytosis, if you start saying that it's a process of engulfment or eating any particle by a cell in three steps, that gives you again an overview that yes, the student knows what they are reading, right? It's a process of engulfment of a solid particle. This is what phagocytosis primarily means, but you can also say engulfment of bacteria. If it's respect to acute inflammation, I can say bacteria, but my WBC can eat any solid particle for the matter by the same process, which is called as phagocytosis, right? Engulfment of solid particle by a cell, and it's a three-step process. These steps are more important. See, we don't want you to excel in everything. If you know the roots, definitely you will find the way to understand them. That's all. So the first and the most important thing is you need to have recognition and attachment to the particle. I need to recognize the particle. Only then I can attach. Once I attach, I engulf. Once I engulf, I kill and degrade the particle, right? The first thing is recognition. Okay. Recognition is nothing but identifying them with the help of opsonization. It's an indirect term, that's all, right? Second for me is engulfment. I'm going to eat. I'm sure you know that there's a pseudopod which is thrown, which com uh, completely engulfs the bacteria or any solid particle and swallows them, right? The third part is killing and degradation. It's killing and degradation is a third step, right? So I have three steps in phagocytosis and I want you to write the three steps. Again, like I said, it's not the end outcome. If you know the process, if you do the process properly, automatically you will understand what happens here. So recognition, again, has multiple steps. If I don't want you to go into each and every step of recognition, but to be easier and superficial, I have multiple factors which help me in recognize. Have you heard about something called a tall like receptor? You must have heard, right? You must have heard toll like receptors even in immunology, in your microbiology, and in pathology, right? Toll like receptor is the one way of recognition, right? And also we have few other ways of recognition also. Okay. Just give me a second. So one is toll like receptors, second is cytokines. I can have cytokines which will sit on the WB uh, the bacteria so my my cell can go and bind to it. I have mannose binding lectin. I have lipopolysaccharide of the cell wall, right? All these are recognition, recognition particle, which help me in recognizing things, right? So like I said, the first thing, first step for me is recognition. So for recognition to happen, there are multiple steps. There are multiple factors required. You need not excel everything. If you give a brief overview, that should be more than enough, right? So for recognition of a micro, I can have chemokines, I can have formyl peptides, I can have microbial products, I can have toll-like receptors, or I can have your simple, your uh, immunoglobulin and the complement proteins. Many, many things can be recognition thing, right? So, so recognition is a step by which the WBC identifies the organism. The bacteria here in our question, right? So because we started the entire class with a streptococcus, that's all, it's the bacteria, right? It's initiated by few expression of the receptors on the macrophage surface. Whenever we say macrophage, it's equivalent to WBC, right? So what happens is, draw something, let's understand this in WBC. On the surface of WBC, I have few receptors. So these are the mannose binding lectin receptors. Okay. We have 
toll like receptors tlr stands for toll like receptors and we have few other scavenger receptors when i say scavenger because i need to eat not just the bacteria i also need to eat the dead particles right so all these will be represented on the wbc surface and when i have the bacteria here i'm just writing bacteria the bacteria can be having multiple products again this bacteria also is going to give me signals because this receptor has to bind to some ligand right so these signals are the opsonizing factors which engulfs the bacteria forming right so these signals are the opsonizing factors it can be like i said a lipopolysaccharide of the bacterial wall which is there in the bacteria you can have lectins so the lectins is the one which actually binds with mannose it's a mannose binding lectin right i can have complement proteins c3b is a very very powerful opsonin you can have immunoglobulins igg especially the fc fragment of igg especially right because when i have a bacterial infection i'll have immunoglobulin coming into the picture for sure the immunoglobulin binds on the bacteria so all these binds on the surface of the bacteria so the bacteria is identified by the wbc and the wbc sends its mannose binding lectin toll like receptor and few scavenger receptors okay this goes and attaches so once it's attached i'll engulf it now so once engulfment is done that's my second step the first step is recognition the second step for us is a simple engulfment okay engulfment is always by an pseudopod formation i send out a extension right because uh, the wbc surface is made of phospholipid bilayer it's a very fluid membrane so and wbc in mesenchyme right any mesenchyme has actin molecules so cell can easily move right so engulfment is by pseudopod formation pseudopod formation is a very classical term which is used use them in your exam hall right so let's assume this is a wbc and this is my bacteria here so the wbc sends a pseudopod pseudo is false pod is an extension so this pseudopod formation is going to engulf the wbc so once the uh, sorry engulf the bacteria right so once it engulfs the bacteria it forms something which is inside the bacteria the wbc a bacteria will be held in the form of a membrane bound vesicle called as a phagosome right so let's assume this is a bacteria it's just an atp de derived mechanism this is done with the help of actin actin polymerizes i just need energy here that's all fine okay a uh, hope world what a scavenger receptor means like i said uh, this process is phagocytosis i am not talking only with respect to bacteria if there's a lipid or a cell debris i need to eat them as well right so which scavenger is something who removes all the dead particles that's a scavenger right so if i have any dead particle around a dead cell around these receptors goes and binds them and removes them that's why we call a scavenger receptor right simply clever you can read it now or you have good amount of time when you come back to mbbs you can read it right all the very best for your neat ug so finish that and maybe come uh, back to us later fine okay so this is just an actin dependent mechanism that's all actin goes binds with the help of atp right okay so once this is there it forms a structure called as an phagosome phagosome can come in a two mark question if you have a two mark in your uh, uh, university exam pattern you can come phagosome is nothing but a membrane bound phagocytic vacuole which has anything which has been phagocytosis can be a bacteria can be a cell debris gouty crystals are been phagocytosis anything that's what i mean by phagosome fine the next process is your killing and degradation that's the last process in your phagocytosis right i have to kill the organism and i have to degrade the organism right so now i have wbc's here and then i have my uh, bacteria here which is inside the wbc right okay uh, let me add up welcome i hope your pg is doing good right so once you have the wbc uh, the neutrophils for example and i have a phagosome so these neutrophils they have granules right can anyone tell me what granules are these what granules are they made of so i have a wbc here and i have granules here these granules are your lysosomal granules right yeah lysosomal granules you might read in multiple places substances which end with som lysosome phagosome 
inflammasome right multiple things whenever something ends with some it's not a single protein it's not a single substance it's a complicated thing right any some apoptosome it's a group of proteins fine okay it's a group of group of proteins uh, great help me doc best wishes keep doing well in your pg and uh, teach more people in your field fine okay let's come back to this it's a group of proteins there right so i have these lysosomal granules and i have this phagosome which is sitting inside here okay we have the green particle right so it is sitting inside here so the next step here is the fusion phago lysosome formation okay so phago lysosome formation is a step is the first step in the killing mechanism once i have the phago lysosome formation it's easy to understand for me how it kills there are two different ways of killing just mention them and one type of killing will elaborate right in the phago lysosome formation i have something called an oxygen dependent killing mechanism which is very very potent which we will be reading in detail the other one is oxygen independent mechanism okay. one is oxygen dependent the other one is oxygen independent mechanism oxygen dependent like i said is more powerful with required if you want to write at least a few words for oxygen independent mechanism right you can add, just add on saying that there are few lysosomal granules called as lactoferrin which destroy substances there are lysosomal granule products called as an elastase these are enzymes which can destroy the organism just a name of you there are multiple granule contents you need not remember everything and write everything just few for name sake but what is more important for me is oxygen dependent that's important because that takes care of the entire killing of almost every organism which we engulf right it's oxygen dependent so what is the first step to start with it's undoubtedly the oxygen right so obviously it has to start with the oxygen so the oxygen dependent killing mechanism it starts with oxygen so once and remember all these happens inside the phago lysosome so once i have an oxygen i have something present an enzyme na dph oxidase as the name says it oxidizes I have oxygen and i'm having an oxidase so i end up in having something called an o2 minus okay perfect i'll have a free radical right oxidase will have free radical so this free radical i'm going to call it a super oxide free radical okay a super oxide free radical right so when i have a super oxide free radical it's a free radical whenever my body produces free radical what do you think uh, the, uh, will there be a defensive mechanism yes obviously yes right so my body produces free radical i'll have free radical scavengers or antioxidants which will come and destroy them or remove them right so once my pro body produces superoxide what is the enzyme which will immediately act on it i have sod superoxide dismutase Again, SOD is a very known abbreviation. You can use the abbreviation, or if you have time and space, write superoxide dismutase, or at least in brackets, write dismutase. Fine. So once there is superoxide dismutase, it ends up in having H2O2, hydrogen peroxide. So this hydrogen peroxide has dual pathways, based on if I have eaten a bacteria or if I have eaten a parasite, because both can be an acute inflammation, right? I am sure you accept that. a parasitic infection can also be an acute right so i have two op possibilities here if it's going to be parasite you can write in bigger writing here if it's a parasite i will have one method if it's a bacteria which has been engulfed i have another method okay so if it's a bacteria primarily it's going to be neutrophils i have the mpo myeloperoxidase with the help of an chlorine and halogen i'm going to form hocl minus okay. so hcl minus is the most potent bactericidal you need not write most potent in a theory exam that's for an mcq point of view if you want to write you can write you have nothing wrong in that but don't forget writing its bactericidal so that's more important for me hypochlorous anion will destroy the bacteria at the same time if with an parasite i have something called an mbp major basic protein which is a very very important component of eosinophil plus iodine which ends up in having hoi okay so this is hypoiodide this destroys your parasite 
it will it'll easily destroy your parasite it will destroy the layers of the parasite that's what i mean by destroys parasite right so this ends up with the entire phagocytosis right it's a simple overview again like i said if you want to add get extra marks always clinical correlation makes a beautiful way of ending something you, if you want you can write here if nadph oxidase is defective put i hyphen if it is absent i have a disease in chronic granulomatous disease so correlation is very very important at every point of time if mpo is absent you can write it's absent in case of mpo deficiency because what we are concerned about is not about how the bacteria kills our goal is only one thing if i have a deficiency how do i diagnose them how do i treat them that's our only goal right a second disease will go up the phagolysome formation this is defective in which disease which disease will have defective phagolysome formation can anyone comment on that maybe a short form of that is also fine which disease it is perfect it is celiac higashi syndrome right you might have heard about this you see it's just few words here but these few words will definitely make an impact of the paper right we have celiac higashi syndrome just give me a second okay. so you have celiac higashi syndrome again it's in a practical application we have chronic granulomatous disease and we have mpo deficiency right i just go up there's a very decent explanation for a five mark question this doesn't take time at all only when you write in paragraphs it will consume time see i am defining what is phagocytosis by definition and i'm telling there are three steps forming a very strong solid base that you know stuff then recognition what do you mean by recognition and the particles i have something in the wbc side the manos binding lectin receptors the toll like receptors scavenger receptors and i have your uh, immunoglobulin your complement and your lipopolysaccharide from the bacterial side so once it happens the second step is phagolysome formation with the help of actin the only thing i need here first atp and energy once that happens killing by degradation phagolysome formation is my first step then i have oxygen dependent oxygen independent and oxygen dependent we know what is required right that ends your phagocytosis and killing fine so that's the second part here so we know about phagocytosis killing we know about your your acute inflammation right so now I'll just go to chronic inflammation right so what do you understand by chronic inflammation again like i said everything if it starts with an uh, tiny definition it'll make a huge difference what do you understand by the term chronic inflammation it's a short lived long lived and how will it end chronic inflammation undoubtedly is a long lived thing right it can be days it can be weeks it can be months and sometimes it can be even years right so chronic inflammation is a response to prolonged duration of inflammation or a trigger the inflammation will almost always end up in one thing what is the hallmark of every chronic inflammation hallmark of every chronic inflammation same thing tissue destruction uh tanbir will chronic inflammation have abscess what is abscess abscess is pus formation right pus formation is acute pus formation is generally not chronic right it's generally not chronic fine so chronic inflammation like you said it's long lived that's absolutely right right it's a response of prolonged duration in which the inflammation will invariably end in tissue damage and it will heal by fibrosis that's what chronic inflammation means right it's an long lived response to any offending agent it can be bacteria it can be virus it can be an autoimmune condition it can be a foreign body anything right to so any noxious stimuli noxious means it's going to cause damage to my body that's what i mean by noxious right noxious stimuli which may last for days to weeks or even months and most likely ends with tissue damage or tissue injury and heals by fibrosis okay 
See, this covers all the points which is required for me. I know it's long lived. I know it will have tissue damage because these both are hallmarks of any chronic inflammation. Tissue damage and healing by fibrosis is a hallmark for any chronic inflammation. Tell me any one chronic inflammatory disease which comes to your mind. Any one chronic inflammatory disease. Anyone? Tuberculosis? The classical finding of tuberculosis, lung, cavity formation and fibrosis, right? Fibro cavity inflammation. That's why it is, right? Okay. It's fibro cavity thing, right? Uh, simply clever. Uh, yes, there are lots of uh, medicines to take care of the chronic inflammation. Like I said, you will read them when we come to your MBBS. Uh, that's right. So yes, tuberculosis is chronic inflammation. You will have lung damage and it will heal by fibrosis. Fibro cavity lesion is the hallmark of tuberculosis. Any chronic inflammation in the body will have tissue damage and it will heal by fibrosis, right? So, and the most important thing is you can add one more thing the cell of chronic inflammation. What do you think is the cell of chronic inflammation? What is cell of chronic inflammation? Anyone? The cell of chronic inflammation is not lymphocyte because by default, what comes to my mind is a cell of chronic inflammation means it has to be a lymphocyte. It's not lymphocyte. It's actually macrophages. It is not lymphocyte, right? It is macrophage. Perfect. And this same thing. Don't write lymphocyte. Lymphocyte will be a cell of inflammation if the etiology is virus or an autoimmune disorder. Tuberculosis. Macrophage is the primary culprit. Lymphocyte can come. Macrophage is a cell of chronic inflammation. Lymphocyte is secondary for me. Fine. Okay. Now, since I know macrophage is the reason for chronic inflammation, I need to add a few points about macrophages because there are two types of macrophages, which is very, very important for me to understand about chronic inflammation and the tuberculosis pathogenesis. You can write the same pathogenesis what you're going to discuss for tuberculosis easily. Fine. So when I have macrophage, I have a normal macrophage, which function is phagocytosis and I have an activated macrophage which function is secretion that will secrete it will not undergo phagocytosis right so there are two types of macrophages normal macrophage and an activated macrophage macrophage or macrophage however you want to say activated macrophage don't eat they secrete substances that is the one which results in chronic inflammation fine now let's understand entirely what happens in chronic inflammation with the help of tuberculosis right so what happens exactly in chronic inflammation or the pathogenesis of chronic inflammation with an example the prototype is tuberculosis right let's assume you inhale tb bacilli tb bacilli is acquired by inhalation predominantly right so it goes to the lung in the lungs i have macrophages pulmonary alveolar macrophages that will eat the TB bacilli, right? So once I have this, the pulmonary alveolar macrophage is going to engulf. I'll just put a tiny nucleus here for understanding. Will engulf my TB bacilli. This is your macrophage with TB bacilli. The problem with this TB bacilli is they divide inside macrophage, which means macrophage cannot destroy TB bacilli. HOC is not enough for me to destroy TB bacilli. It's, it's blocking the function of macrophage. So what this macrophage does is, macrophage has one more function. They function something called an antigen presenting cell. So with the help of this antigen presentation, the MHC2 complex, it will present my TB antigen. Okay? Because that's what I am not able to kill. To one CD4 T lymphocyte. Because MHC2 complex binds to your CD4. I am sure you know that, right? I was not able to destroy it. So I gave rise to a CD4 cell. So if you remember your immunology, CD4 has multiple uh, ways of activation. It has TH1 pathway, it has TH2 pathway, and it has your TH17 pathway. There are multiple ways of activation, right? So what happens here is this CD4 gets bifurcated into TH1 pathway. TH stands for T helper cell. We call CD4 as T helper cell, right? So it becomes TH1 pathway. So this TH1 pathway CD helper cell will secrete interferon gamma. 
this is important this came even in your last INACD exam right so the basics are very very important INACD exam was just over this was simplest question which came here interferon gamma this interferon gamma is the one which converts my normal macrophage into an activated macrophage what's the function of activated macrophage it is secretion and not phagocytos right it's going to secrete so this activated macrophage will further secrete substances they secrete interleukin 12 interleukin 2 these are the two main things there are multiple things an activated macrophage secretes it also secretes reactive oxygen species it secretes lysosome enzymes multiple things right interleukin 1 interleukin 2 are something which is very very important for me and interleukin 12 in addition to this they also secrete reactive oxygen species which destroys the bacteria or at least tries to destroy the bacteria right so interleukin 1 and 2 are lymphotrophic factors lymphotrophic means they are going to attract more and more and more cd4 lymphocytes as interleukin 1 sorry interleukin 12 helps in conversion of cd4 to t helper 1 pathway so you know now where i am leading to so what happens is this interleukin 12 will attract and bring more and more cd4 things and this so interleukin 1 and 2 interleukin 12 will convert more of cd4 to th1 if it converts to th1 what's going to happen perfect th1 will secrete interferon gamma if it secretes interferon gamma it will convert them into more activated macrophages in other words if i try to zoom them out it's a very vicious cycle right it keeps on going the same way again and again till the bacteria that tb is destroyed so it's a vicious cycle it keeps on happening again and again this is what leads to your granuloma formation so i'll have at the end of the day more and more and more activated macrophages so how a granuloma is formed is a granuloma is made of simple things you can actually draw a granuloma if you take your eosin and hematoxin pencil to your exams a granuloma will have long activated macrophages which are also called as epithelioid cells oid means like they look like an epithelial cell with a nucleus in the base it looks like a columnar epithelium right it's not an epithelium that's why it calls them epithelioid not an activated macrophages and surrounded by i have lymphocytes lymphocytes are small round blue cells which are seen surrounding your granuloma some of some time yes the granulomas can have something which is called as giant cells can anyone name what's a Jain cell in tuberculosis? You must have read about tuberculosis. What is a Jain cell in tuberculosis called as? They yeah, have very particular name. What is it called as? It is. Starts with L. Can you name them? We can mark them. The lymphocyte surrounding the granuloma. Right. Instead of activated macrophage, write a different name here. So that they know that you know both the names here. Epithelioid cells. Epithelial like cells. And since we are talking about tuberculosis, we can write Jain cells or even write Langhans type of Jain cells. You must have heard Langhans, right? Langhans type of Jain cells that results in the formation of a granuloma, right? So now we know about a granuloma, how it is being formed. I'll just go up so that, see, this is a five mark question. This is more than enough for a five mark question. You define it, maybe one mark, cell of inflammation, talk about macrophage, your uh, normal and activated. Then the pathogenesis, then the entire thing about it, and end with a type of granulomas, right? So granulomas has multiple types. How do you broadly classify granuloma? There's a broad classification of granuloma. What is that? We call them two things. One with necrosis, one without necrosis, right? So we use the term necrotizing granuloma and non-necrotizing granuloma. Uh, most of the textbooks say that caseating granuloma and non-caseating granuloma. I am okay with you calling anything, call it necrotizing or non-necrotizing, caseating or non-caseating, but the ideal one is necrotizing because caseous is a gross term, not a microscopic term, right? So I have types of granuloma, we call them necrotizing granulomas and non-necrotizing granulomas, okay? So there's a basic difference. It's very simple to remember tables if you understand the concept behind tables. If you memorize at some point of time you will forget because you have a very long period of learning right what does necrosis mean can anyone here comment 
what does necrosis mean in the simplest way possible what do you mean by necrosis can i say that necrosis means it is nothing but cell death yes so can i say if my immunity or the inflammation is able to kill something i'll have necrotizing granuloma simple fair enough if i'm not able to kill something i'll have non necrotizing granuloma that's all simple so the way to differentiate them is if my body can kill something that's a bacteria tuberculosis leprosy yeah coccidiomycosis i can kill this that's a fungal organism right you can kill a coccidiomycosis you can kill something called an cat scratch disease Though there is a very special type of granuloma here, but cat scratch disease also comes under necrotizing granuloma only. It's called as an stellate granuloma. We'll ignore that. So I can kill these because it's a bacteria. The immunity or inflammation came to kill them, so I call all of them as necrotizing granuloma. So if I can't kill, I put them under non-necrotizing. There's no necrosis there. Again here, write in big words TB. The reason why I want you to remember TB is till you are in India. whenever you see granuloma or when any pathologist sees granuloma the first and the only thing they will remember is tuberculosis let's say i'm having tuberculosis i got my tb organism my immunity is not that great do you think my body will be able to kill tb not at all right will not be able to kill tb so tb can be both necrotizing and non necrotizing based on the immune status of the patient good immunity kill the tb eradicate bad immunity live with the tb not able to eradicate so tb can cause both you might ask can leprosy also cause both coccidiomycosis and cat scratch can but i don't have so many cases of them to say it's not necrotizing also right so tb both the places apart from this you cannot kill a foreign body any foreign body granuloma will be non necrotizing coal workers pneumoconiosis can you kill a coal It's already a dead particle. Silicosis, already a dead particle. I cannot kill them, right? You cannot kill anything in sarcoidosis. You cannot kill anything in your uh, Hodgkin's lymphoma. There's no organism to kill in Hodgkin's lymphoma, right? The simple way to differentiate necrotizing and non-necrotizing granuloma is: if you are able to kill something, call it necrotizing granuloma. If you are not able to kill something, call it non-necrotizing granuloma. Remember this funda. and write whatever you can write if you forget this you'll have to memorize necrosis means death if you can kill necrotizing if you can't kill non necrotizing this ends your chronic inflammation right so that more than enough definition steps ends with granuloma and types of granuloma for chronic inflammation fine right? so that's your chronic inflammation now let's come back to one more maybe a short answer or a two uh, mark question okay what opposites simply clever did i goof up something if i can kill it's necrotizing if i can't kill it's non necrotizing that's what it is fine if i have told wrongly ignore okay. so we have exudate and we have transudate like i said it can come in a short answer difference between exudate transudate or it can come in a two three mark question what do you mean by exudate and transudate right so before understanding what is exudate and transudate means right you have to know what is edema means because these both are uh, types of edema fluid right so both of them are types of edema fluid can anyone define edema because both of them are types of edema fluid again for everything you need to start with the definition even if they ask you a difference just like that go don't go and put a table start what is edema and then talk about exudate and transudate fine right? so when i say edema edema is extra cellular accumulation of fluid that's what we call as edema right it should not be inside the cell it should be outside the cell right edema is nothing but extra cellular accumulation of fluid it can be in the pleural space we call it effusion right okay meet very good question see uh, uh, to answer your question why do you think i have a chronic inflammation i have a chronic inflammation because neutrophils were not able to destroy them right my neutrophil cannot destroy that that's why i need it chronic right 
macrophage ate the bacteria cannot destroy so i got the help of multiple other bacteria so to kill one single bacteria i needed like 100 to 1000 cells so it's a force which is required maybe a mosquito i hit it dies a millipede centipede doesn't hit when you die you have to keep on hitting that's a difference it's a bit of a powerful infection so i need more force for destruction that's why i need granuloma for formation right i hope you can understand the difference okay. come back to so edema is nothing but extracellular accumulation of fluid edema can be of two major types the edema fluid as well as effusion right it can be of two major types i have something question transudate and exudate okay before jumping to transudate and exudate we need to understand about the simple dynamics of your blood so if you can understand simple dynamics of blood we can easily understand why i have edema fluid so we have a blood vessel a simple normal blood vessel okay. i have two things here two forces acting i have something called hydrostatic force we have an arterial end let's assume and we have a venous end let's assume or in capillary end let's assume in between i have capillary bed okay. so i have an outward force this i'm going to call it a hydrostatic force and I have an inward force. Can anyone name the inward force? What pulls the fluid in, into the blood vessel? It's due to your plasma proteins. Can you name them? You must have read this. Colloid osmotic pressure. Or you also call them oncotic pressure. Okay. Or an colloid. Colloid is your protein. Osmotic pressure. So in general, there's a perfect balance. Because it's perfect balance, the fluid doesn't escape outside and my body maintains a very normal laminar flow. Little bit of fluid goes outside. Whatever fluid goes outside will be taken by capillaries and lymphatics. Very little goes outside will be taken by capillaries and lymphatics. If I have a disturbance of any of these edema fluid lessons, the disturbance can be due to hydrostatic problem or my disturbance can be due to oncotic problem. That's what gives you the different types of edema, right? Now our main question is the difference between transudate and an exudate. Right? Exudate is an inflammatory type of an edema. That's what we mean by exudate. Right? So uh, what is the hallmark of acute inflammation? What is the hallmark of any acute inflammation? Yes. Vasodilatation and increase in vascular permeability. Right? So the vasodilatation and the increase in pressure is the one which pushes the fluid outside. So by definition, exudate is an inflammatory edema due to increased vascular permeability as simple as that right it's an inflammation related edema due to increased vascular permeability okay i do have translate also let's assume uh, you have a patient with a heart failure will that be plural and plural effusion happening or edema in the pedal your foot yes you'll have pedal edema for sure right so that is due to the plasma going outside without damage to the endothelium. So the just the pressure changes because of them they're going outside. But in inflammation, I'll have damage to endothelium. We read about all the steps of acute inflammation. Damage happens then. Here, it's just filtration without damage to endothelium. That's important. So if you know this difference, it's very simple for me to fill the rest of the thing. Okay. Have you made tea? Normal tea. You must have that be a filter, right? You pour the tea, the tea particles get stopped by the filter. But still the tea goes outside. That's just pressure causing it. If the tea filter as a whole, the particle also will go outside, right? That's what happens in exudate. The endothelium is damaged. So there's a hole so bigger particles also go outside so which of these two protein with the bigger particle can go outside obviously the one with endothelial damage obviously right? the one with endothelial damage the so protein particles will definitely go outside right so this is characterized by inflammation and here there is no inflammation or no endothelial injury fine so protein content will be more in case of an exudate because there's a hole or damage to the endothelium. Yeah. 
it will not be elevated right it will be long normal or low right it will not be elevated there's no elevation it will be same as your plasma fluid that's all fine okay now i have one a meet very good question if you remember the pathogens of hypertension what happens in hypertension is yes you are right in saying that there's an excess pressure happening in the hypertension the hydrostatic pressure but you must have also read about something called an vessel auto regulation if you remember your physiology you must have read so when my blood pressure is 120 when it increases to 130 my vessel change in the caliber so i don't have the problem but when my heart fails that's a center mechanism failing so this pressure disturbance will definitely cause edema hypertension will generally not cause edema unless and until there's a predisposing factor i hope it makes sense let's come to glucose content in an exudate i have bacteria inflammation can i say the bacteria will consume the glucose they will right so there'll be low glucose content here there'll be same as plasma because i have lots of activated wbc's here bacteria there the exudate will consume all of the glucose the energy so the content comes low right okay i have one of the thing with very very high amount of proteins Will it have more specific gravity? Obviously, yes. It will be in very high specific gravity. Specific gravity, again, is one of the uh, important components for that is protein. But here, I don't have that. So, I have low specific gravity. pH here will be a little bit acidic. pH here will more or less be normal, close to 7.4. The reason why I'm saying a little bit of an acidic pH in case of an x ray is, again, same. I'm consuming glucose. Metabolism happening more rapidly. When every glucose has been consumed, little bit about uh, of uh, other alternative mechanism of consumption happens. Slight production of acid will be there, lactic acid. That reduces the pH to some extent. Again, this, even if you don't write, I don't care because it regulates again. Because pH is something is very important for me, it will definitely regulate, right? LDH will be high here. LDH will be low here. Again, I'll tell you why, what is the reason about LDH. LDH is an enzyme inside the cell. So when I have endothelial damage, can I say that the uh, endothelium dies and the intracellular and in LDH can come outside? Yes. And again, I have neutrophils coming in and inflammation. Neutrophil dies. Whenever any cell in my body dies, obviously the intracellular LDH will come outside. Same concept of seeing LDH in your hemolytic anemia or even in your myocardial infarction. Whenever there is necrosis of any cell or death of any cell, LDH comes outside. That's all. It's as simple as that, right? And there, I don't have anything, so LDH stays there, right? So here, in effusion, the LDH of the effusion versus serum LDH, the ratio is more than 0.6. This might be required, especially when you go to your uh, medicine postings and when you start reading about pleural effusion. As of now, just remember the name, number. When you go to your plural effusion, there are lots of criteria called as light criteria where it's required for you to understand plural fluid as an exudate or a transudate. Fine. Cells. One is endothelial damage. The same example I gave for proteins. Cell also will come outside, right? There'll be many cells here. There'll be increased number of cells or increased WBC for the matter. Here it's just filtered. So very rarely cells are present. It's just a filtration. There's no damage. Very rarely cells are present. Examples. Someone uh, sometime back told about abscess. First formation is an example. Abscess is an example. Okay, that's an exudate. The simplest exudate all of you must have experienced. When you have a sore throat, everyone must have had a sore throat, right? When you spit, what is the color of fluid? Slightly yellowish color. Right? That's an exudate. Yellowish to green color because of the myeloperoxys. Neutrophils, that's all. That's an exudate. Edema in a heart failure. Fetal edema in case of a congestive cardiac failure or congestive heart failure. Right? That's a very classical example. Be it pleural effusion or fetal edema, which happens in transudate, right? So we know about exudate transudate difference. This can definitely come in an exam. Even if it's not coming in an exam, it's a very, very potential question for Viva. Do remember that. And like I said, start everything with a basic description and then go to the table. Because this gives you a buffer. So you have to think in terms of an examiner perspective. I ask you difference, but you give me an extra information and then go to the difference. I can give a holistic, okay, this person understands how to write an answer. That's all. Right? Okay, that's about it. Let's quickly go to the next topic of wound healing. 
own healing can come as a five mark question or sometimes even as a long answer question right own healing is important for you uh, there are multiple steps of own healing multiple types of own healing and there are multiple factors which affect own healing as well right so can anyone tell me um, what are the types of own healing you know healing by dash and healing by there are two types of own healing you can have a question on describe briefly about a scar formation or the two different types of own healing healing by primary intention and secondary intention the uh, meat whenever it's non inflammatory it will be transudate only whenever it's inflammatory it will be exudate right so nephrotic syndrome is non inflammatory right when i say nephrotic syndrome i am not talking about the urine Atla protein that's different. That's a pathogenesis. The edema in the in and around the eye is a transudate edema. Okay. When I say cirrhosis, ascites, if it is not infected, it's transudate. If it's infected, there's something called a spontaneous bacterial peritonitis, which happens in ascites, which becomes an exudate. If it's inflammation associated edema, it's exudate. Any edema where there's no inflammation, it's non-exudate. Right? Okay. Perfect. There are two types. Right, Pankaj. we have your uh, healing by primary intention and healing by secondary intention right the so wound healing is the body's response to any injury in an attempt to restore the normal structure and function like i said everything requires a definition right so wound healing also will start with the definition it's a body's response to any injury whatever may be the injury in an attempt to restore the normal function and structure or you can write to restore homeostasis homeostasis is nothing but normal physiology right or you can write to restore normal structure and function it's both it's not just function i need to if i have a breach in my skin i need to make sure the skin comes out first right then only i think about the function of the skin that's a definition right here there are two different types i have a regeneration i have a scar formation right so there are two things here one i divide the wound healing based on the type of healing i call it healing by primary intention okay and healing by secondary intention and i also can divide them into two different process one is called as an regeneration and the other one is repair by scar formation i'll tell you the difference here because the difference might be required for you to understand a little bit in detail okay jai hind tech so you have a mosquito bite simple example you scratch it can i say there is an wound here obviously there is a wound right but will you have a scar formation here or it becomes automatically normal it will become normal i won't have anything that's regeneration a very very superficial injury regenerates without making any noise at the same time i fall down i have a laceration will it have scar formation it will that's repair by scar formation need not just have laceration you have a um, surgical cut scar a normal cut that also has scar formation that's repair so regeneration is a very superficial damage repair is something which is bit deeper which causes bleeding which causes destruction of the epithelium of the mucosa which has repair right when i come with primary and secondary intention again the basic difference here so primary intention happens in any place with no or less tissue loss that's a basic definition of it i have a very negligible tissue loss your surgical scar tissue will be lost very very minimal or no tissue loss secondary intention happens in places with significant tissue loss that's a definition of it or in one word i can describe them it's with significant tissue loss i'll give an example a patient has a myocardial infarction heart attack will there be death of cardiac myocytes yes no obviously there will be right so that is primary intention or secondary intention it's healing by perfect it is secondary intention surgical scar is healing by primary intention laceration falling down healing by secondary intention burns 
tissue loss healing by second intention right so if i have very less or no tissue loss primary intention significant tissue loss second intention right now now i gave a brief introduction of what is healing and different types of healing right now let's go to understanding the steps of healing and here the steps of healing will be understanding with the help of primary intention only the reason why we learnt about primary intention is because uh, both the steps of healing here uh, be it primary or second edition steps are the same steps of healing is the same there's no difference in steps of healing the only difference what happens is a timeline that's all in second edition i have tissue loss so it'll take much more time for my neutrophil to go away much more time for my granulation tissue to happen the reason why we took primary intention and we researched on primary intention is it's easy to calibrate easy to understand because there's no tissue loss happens everywhere in most of parts of the body right first step of any wound healing here is obviously lava bleeding and followed by a clot formation generally when students write about wound healing they jump into inflammation that's your wbc inflammation will happen but this is very very important for me even be before inflammation clot formation is very very important for wound healing i'll tell you why let's assume this is skin and i have a cut here the deep cut or a surgical incision there's a cut here so in this cut is where i'm going to have the clot formation right so am i right in saying that in the clot formation only neutrophils will go inside macrophage will go inside and start to form the scar yes let's assume there's no clot do you think anything can go in the gap nothing can go in the gap right so the clot formation is the first and the vital step for wound healing which is required most of the students miss it don't miss it right it happens immediately you know the clotting time right four to five minutes immediately it happens after clot formation the second step like all of you know it will be neutrophil entry neutrophils enter neutrophils enter within 24 hours within 24 hours neutrophils come most of the time within 24 hours neutrophils do come right so after this the function of neutrophils to remove any debris present in the wound when i say debris it could be bacteria it could be dead cells anything they have to remove everything that's a function of neutrophils after neutrophils who will come back any time neutrophils will almost always be replaced by macrophages neutrophils will be replaced by macrophages right so after this neutrophils it will be replaced by macrophages any inflammation neutrophils will be replaced by macrophages within 24 hours they also have a deadline before 24 hours they have to eliminate everything if they don't eliminate if they can't eliminate they'll be replaced right so after this i'll have macrophages the third step of wound healing is neutrophils will be replaced by macrophage macrophage or macrophage whatever you want to call it right so macrophage will be there the maximum or the peak of the macrophage will be there around third day okay third step and third day there are two functions of macrophage here one is to clear neutrophils the second and the most important step is to become activated macrophage can anyone tell me what is the function of activated macrophage we just a uh, few minutes back we saw that they become activated macrophage what is the function of activated macrophage anyone phagocytosis or secretion Activated macrophages secrete, right? They clear the debris at the same time. This activated macrophage will be secreting substances for wound healing. Okay. When I say substances, your TGF beta, your platelet derived growth factors, right? Your uh, VEGF, vascular endothelial growth factor, all of them are secreted by the macrophage only, right? So it has two vital roles. One, clear the neutrophils at the same time, do this. Uh, yes meat every secondary intention almost always will end up in having a scar formation that's how it is because i have a tissue loss i have to bridge it by scar formation very rarely in a tissue like liver which has an extreme high regenerative capacity there's a chance even if i have a tissue loss it can regenerate again there's an exception barring that every other tissue in the body it will have scar formation only right okay perfect and so I'll have secretion right it secretes substances like 
बी जी एफ सी जी एफ बीटा there are multiple more things but these are important for me at least remember them so this helps in the next step so i need some time for vegf and tgf beta to act vegf the name says this will give rise to capillaries tgf beta is a very powerful chemo attractant for fibroblast which produces collagen right they attract fibroblast and this fibroblast produces collagen the initial collagen produced for us is collagen 3 it's a very new collagen i cannot bring the strongest collagen initially i'll form collagen 3 only right so this is my next stage the fourth stage of wound healing and we call this stage capillary multiple tiny capillary with bridging collagen tissue we call it an granulation tissue granulation tissue is a hallmark of healing tissue so whenever you have a wound, let's say you are a surgeon, you have put a suture, it's healing or not, granulation tissue should be present. Or you have a diabetic foot ulcer. If the granulation tissue is formed properly, okay, healing is normal. If not, some problem happening, right? So we have to remove every non-viable tissue and make sure granulation tissue happens, right? So this happens in and around day 5. Day 5 is where you will have a very good and a well formed granulation tissue like I said it's an hallmark of healing tissue it will be bright red in color if you next time when you go to surgery wards uh, ask your surgery PG or intern to show you a freshly cleaned diabetic foot that's where you see the granulation tissue you touch the tissue you poke the tissue it will bleed because they formed of capillaries very freshly formed capillaries they are not yet complete and will start bleeding, right? So that's a healing tissue. Once I have the healing tissue, the next step for me is very, very simple. The last and the final step, the fifth step here or the fifth stage of wound healing here is a perfect scar formation. So for me to form a scar, I obviously need a very strong collagen. Strongest tissue in my body is bone. Can anyone tell me what type of collagen is there in bone? Strongest tissue is obviously bone, right? So what type of collagen is there in the bone? We have collagen one, right? So in a scar formation, it will be replaced by collagen one. It will be replaced by collagen one, right? And this collagen one formation, again, let's go back to an example of bone only. Bones collagen, will it remodel or it won't remodel? Will it remodel or it won't remodel? It will remodel, right? So this scar formation, you will have remodeling. The remodeling happens. Remodeling goes for up to easily three months to six months. It will take its own sweet time, right? Remodeling makes sure the main purpose it will be, it will strengthen scar formation. Remodeling can happen up to three months. It will take up to three months for me to send the scar formation. And initially for every prime edition, scar will be seen on day seven. Within day seven, I'll have scar formation, right? And once even after three months of remodeling, the final scar which happens, it will not be as good as a normal tissue. It will maximum have 70% strength and function of a normal tissue. It cannot become 100% at any point of time. Even if my skin is broken, it can never ever reach 100%. It will be maximum 70%, right? That's what happens in a wound healing, right? The simple thing, I just go up, define wound healing. What do you mean by wound healing? It's a body's response, trying to restore the normal thing, but I can't, which we know. There are different types, regeneration and repair. If you want examples, give example for regeneration repair, primary, secondary intention. Again, if you want example, give example. Then start with steps of wound healing with primary intention. And these are the steps which happens. You'll have clot. Don't forget that neutrophils comes followed by macrophage, becomes activated macrophage, secretes VGF, TGF beta, produces neoangiogenesis granulation tissue, and produces scar collagen one by day seven, and remodels till up to three months. And maximum strength is going to be a seventy percent. I like I said, I cannot have a scar 
more than 70 percent of the normal strength that's that's like more or less final fine so again if you want to extend it if you feel it's very short you can give a little bit of uh, maybe an uh, table saying the difference between primary and secondary intention right so healing by primary intention and healing by secondary intention so this might give you a brief understanding or differences to end it okay so like i said it is very less or no tissue loss that's what i call by healing by primary intention and it should be clean and in uninfected wounds that's very important if the infection comes automatically tissue loss will come it should be clean and uninfected here it's an open wound an infected wound or a wound with tissue loss will always be healing by secondary intention any tissue loss can be myocardial infarction can be a burn can be a scar tissue anything okay meet uh, when i say chronic inflammation the hallmark of chronic inflammation is undoubtedly tissue damage and healing by fibrosis right so it happens with secondary intention only but again the timeline of secondary intention depends on the extent of tissue damage like for example you have tuberculosis a huge cavity completely covering the lobe of a lung it will have a very typical scar formation covid for example covid can have entire lung having scar or a very tiny scar right it depends on the nature of the damage nature of the chronic inflammation how it's going to cause that right okay okay great so then the amount of fibrin in blood it's always will have here and if i say the fibrin clot in a primary edition it will be a very moderate amount of fibrin right it will be moderate fibrin clot which will be hap happening there here we have very very large fibrin clot because there is a tissue loss there will be huge clot here right and when the inflammation is taken when i say inflammation i take care of the neutrophils macrophage everything it's less intense here because there is very less things to clean for me here and obviously here it will be more intense inflammation right okay which you think will have more granulation tissue there's no rocket science here right so when you take granulation tissue or the healing tissue your primary intention will have a very very minimal granulation tissue it will be difficult for me to find even a granulation tissue in a clean cut surgical scar but here it will be an exuberant or an more a very easily visible granulation tissue right it will definitely be an extensive or an exuberant granulation tissue here Because again, the amount of tissue loss. Fine. Second, next one, the wound contraction. Wound contraction is an outcome. So contraction, I mean, like what we asked, is the degree of fibrosis. Same concept. If the damage is more, contraction is more. I am sure you must have seen patients with burns. The entire skin here might be contracted, right? Acid victims. It will be completely contracted because it's an extensive tissue loss and infection. Wound contraction is less in case of healing by primary intention, right? It's not seen or very, very minimally seen. And wound contraction is marked in case of healing by secondary intention. There's an infection or a tissue loss, wound contraction will definitely be seen here, right? So complications are generally minimal in case of primary intention and it's a bit more in case of secondary intention, right? So you can finish it by saying, okay, these are the basic differences between healing by primary intention and healing by secondary intention. We know about healing by primary, healing by secondary intention. We saw about acute as well as we saw about chronic inflammation, right? So I'll come to an end to of today's discussion. So it's just an overview of in inflammation chapter. And we have dealt about acute inflammation, chronic inflammation, wound healing, superficially. What I didn't cover here is the mediators of inflammation. It's more of a theoretical based topic. There's nothing much to explain in mediators, but I want you to remember the mediators because it might come in exam frequently. Please read the prostaglandins leukotrins with your friends. Fine. If there's any doubt, do let me know. Else we'll call it a day. When do you guys have your uh, final exam? Just an off topic. Uh, sorry, your unit exam. Is it one, two months later or a bit early? If it's a bit later, 
will continue this foray for quite some time so that you can uh, quickly revise all these lectures before the exam all right shanks that's you have four more months intern meet okay mid march okay so what when do you uh, uh, whoever is in second year who is listening here when do you guys want this foray lectures to be uh, right now in november or you feel that if i can if we can take it by december or jan half it will be comfortable which you think is better because uh, I also cleared my MPS. Right? I know that for a fact that last one month or two months is the time that we all go back to the books and we start reading. Right? So just ping me whenever uh, you have time. If you are not able to comment here, it's completely fine. So we'll work on that and we'll make sure that uh, you have adequate resources for you to clear your exam. Fine. Okay, sure, Tanbir. We'll take your inputs and we'll definitely try to do that. Fine. So thank you for your time guys. See you soon. I think you'll have your microbiology for it tomorrow and I will uh, definitely come back to you again with the next schedule. Right? Thank you. Bye-bye. Okay, Shanks. Point taken.